Welcome to the Michigan Film Network podcast series. This is Criminal Miles, a podcast featuring the works of crime novelist Miles Lawrence. These stories contain graphic depictions of violence, adult situations, and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue-generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at mifn.net. Why should you buy a book from your local bookstore? Because books are functional. Even when there's no internet connection, no power, and no working electronic devices. Books are backwards compatible for hundreds of years, as long as the words can be read on the pages. Electronic devices are backwards compatible for about 20 years. Books can literally last hundreds, if not thousands of years. Your cell phone will be outdated in six months. Your electronic device will encounter planned obsolescence, but your copy of a book never will. Your local bookstore is a happy, friendly place where everyone is welcome, and there's nothing like that smell of a brand new book. Your local bookstore is also one of our sponsors, so support Criminal Miles by supporting our sponsors and purchase your copy of this season's Miles Lawrence book there. Criminal Miles presents Keeping Score, written by Miles Lawrence. Chapter 6 Steve slept late. Too much to drink, not enough time to recover. No REM sleep, only alcohol-induced coma. He struggled to sit up. Pain and confusion fill his head as he sat on the edge of his dingy, unmade, queen-size bed, the one that he bought secondhand. He rubbed his chin and felt the stubble, silently wondering why facial hair seemed to grow quicker after a night of drinking. Sergeant Shevsky struggled to his feet and stumbled as the dizziness sets in. Slowly, He made his way through the dirty clothes strewn on the floor and headed for the bathroom. After pausing at the toilet, Steve looked in the mirror. His athletic physique shows the damage from last night. Alcohol has roughened the skin and softened his muscle tone. Although he needs it, no workout today. No dip bar at the station, no curls in the locker room. Today is Steve's day off. He doesn't go near the precinct on off days. They come too few and far between to waste at work. This body needs a long run in the sun. Sweat and bake the booze out, he thought. He dressed slowly, pulling on an old gray t-shirt, blue baggy shorts, and Nike running shoes, no socks. The car heads up Casino Way to the east side of the island. Steve pulls onto the road that circles Belle Isle. On this side of the aisle, it's called the Strand. He stops the car, climbs out, and stares across the river at Canada. Sergeant Shevsky stretches, yawns, and scratches his head. The run begins. Steve heads counterclockwise around the island. He runs in the same direction as the traffic and tries hard to concentrate on his footwork and not his troubles. Count the strides. One, two, three, four. Concentrate. Even pace. Relax, he urges himself. A cop's thinking is strange. He comes to relax on the very same island that has tossed the investigation of two grisly murders into his lap. In order to become a cop, one must have an inborn desire to peer into the dark side of human nature. 
this job consumes them so much that even in their off time, they continue to think and act as cops. Steve Shevsky is no different. His curiosity, especially about this case, has drawn him to the very source of his problems as he tries to relax and get away from the job. The paradox continues. He quickens his pace, trying to keep the thoughts from his head. Soon, all sounds fade. No birds, no traffic. Only the sound of his steps and rhythm with his breathing. No cadence. Steve becomes robotic. The jog is no longer a conscious effort. As his feet hit the pavement, his arms and legs move naturally, almost involuntarily, as the heart pumps blood. Alcohol soaked blood. His thoughts reach the conscious level as beads of sweat form on his brow. His thoughts go back to work. Who did Ellen Adams bring home? Did she know him? Was it someone that she liked and felt comfortable with or just some fuck that she picked up on a drunken, horny night? Did she pick him up or did he charm her? With looks like hers, the compliments would flow easily and endlessly. Or was this just a way to get back at her fiance? His legs feel tired, a result of the alcohol. But Steve pushes on, knowing the fatigue will fade to numbness. In his head, he's thinking, count, one, two, three, four. She brought him home to screw, that's obvious. Her diaphragm was on the floor near the toilet. Ellen probably excused herself to insert the protective device, but then she had second thoughts and dropped it, or possibly got distracted. Steve exhales. She was careful, but not careful enough. His thoughts fade to the past. Stacy used a diaphragm when we first met. She never let me watch her put the damn thing in, though. His face starts to glisten. Dark, wet marks slowly appear on his back and under his arms. Rubber soles repeatedly strike the concrete. The involuntary jogging continues. Steve Shevsky remains in deep thought, a frown on his face. She never gave me a reason for the separation, just that we'd grown apart. She said that she doesn't feel close to me anymore, and hasn't for some time. I don't know. We still do the same things. Talk, eat, sleep, and watch TV. Steve's stride lengthens. Stacy called it stale. I called it comfortable. She changed. I didn't. The pent-up anger inside him is released in one burst. Fuck her! He screams. Steve consciously quickens his pace, an obvious outlet for his aggression. He passes the U.S. Coast Guard station. The strand bends left into Lakeside Drive as his path continues to the north side of the island. His thoughts return despite the conscious effort to focus on the run and relaxation. Twenty years ago, I rented that shitty apartment as a mailing address so I could work in Detroit. Now I fucking live there, alone. We had such good intentions, raise a family, buy a home, and live happily ever after. Never once did she mention growing apart. Fuck! He grits his teeth and presses on. His path turns again. Steve heads south towards the Detroit Yacht Club. He jogs past the club without noticing the sailboats docked in the lagoon to his right. The owners of those boats are too preoccupied in their visions of success to notice the sweaty jogger struggle past. Everyone on the island seems to concentrate only on their own activity. Steve shakes Stacy from his mind. Victim number two replaces his wife. He continues to think. Who was she? Where was she killed? Why was she killed? Was it random or a choice selection? What's the connection? He then speaks to the killer's intellect. What draws you to these women? The pace continues. Steve squeezes his fist tightly as dark triangles of sweat appear at the neckline and taper toward his shorts. His run is half over. 
a slight pain, a cramp, is beginning in his gut. The breathing is out of order. The diaphragm is working out of sync and against the stomach muscles. His diaphragm, not Ellen's. Consciously, Steve sucks in his stomach, breathes, and then exhales as he releases his abdomen. He does this three more times. The muscles re-coordinate themselves and the pain in his side slowly fades. Steve presses on, breathing from the mouth. He purposely counts his steps and eyes the passing cars, not wanting to lose his concentration and lapse back into thought. No more thoughts about the two dead women and a failed marriage is a welcome reprieve in his throbbing head. Steve pushes on. His intentions last until he passes the bridge and rounds the bend. Then he realizes that the Scott Fountain waits patiently for him around the next turn. He accelerates. The run must be complete. The thoughts, the fountain, and the victims are things of the past. The run is the present, and Steve Shevsky knows that he must deal with the present. The past, you cannot change. He's tried, but if you work with the present, you can somewhat control your future. You must finish the run first. Concentrate. One, two, three, four. The last half mile is covered, and Steve pays no attention to the fountain as he circles it at a distance. The road is dotted with parked cars, walkers, joggers, and a few bicyclists, but Steve sees no one. His focus is solely on himself and the task at hand. Acceleration, determination, sweat and pain are his only interests. Accelerate, get the run over. Determination, don't let anyone or anything stop you. Sweat, keep the beer weight off and the waist trim. Pain, yeah, pain. The pains of exercise and exhaustion he can deal with. That's easy. Stop working out, rest, and the pain will subside. But the pain inside is much different and much more complicated. Nothing to date has been able to subdue it. Not time, not women, not alcohol, and not even the job. Steve knows because he tried them all, even the best of the remedies, all four combined and used to excess, have only served to take the edge off, but only for a short time. Then it returns as strong as before. Steve has been unable to find the answers, the medication, to heal his insides. The run now finished, Steve walked up to and collapsed across the trunk of his car. Dry, white, foamy spit forms at the corners of his mouth. A sweat-soaked shirt rises and falls as his lungs work overtime to gather oxygen and aid in the recovery for the body. Steve is lightheaded, his leg muscles weak, spongy, and tired. A smile comes slowly to his face. A good workout has always made him smile. Today's no different. Slowly, the breathing returns to normal and the dizziness fades. He stands, drapes a towel around his neck, and walks toward the fountain, the spot where number two was found. Steve stares directly at the large white marble fountain as it grows closer. He focuses on the water as it spews from the fountain and gently falls back into the pool from where it came. At night, lights are shown against the fountain and the spurt of water turns to a burst of wet colors. Steve wonders if the killer looked at the fountain and noticed its harmless beauty or did he merely see a dumping ground for his victims. Sergeant Shevsky stands alone, staring down at the chalk outline of an unknown girl. For the first time in his career, a tear comes to his eye during a job-related affair. She was too young to die. Not like that. He remembers her cold body lying at the bottom of the slope, where an outline now marks in chalk her final resting place. She had too many years to look forward to. Why did you have to kill her? What's your motivation? What, what makes you tick? 
What's the tie-in with these women? Why them? Steve closes his eyes tightly, fighting the urge to scream out in anger. His thoughts continue. You fucked with the wrong cop. I'm going to nail you. Count on that. Just fuck up once. Leave me a trail, any trail, and I'll bloodhound your ass all the way to hell and back. You've already robbed two women, young, beautiful women of their lives. Somehow, some way, I'm going to make you stop. You sick, twisted fuck. Steve opens his eyes. His speech is now finished. Determination and goals are reaffirmed. Sergeant Shevsky, now sweaty and hangover free, as well as refocused on his job, his only salvation, walks back to his car to head home and enjoy his day off. He enters the apartment fatigued and slightly depressed. A normal morning. The wedding picture is atop the television. Two young lovers. Lost love. Old memories. Steve's thoughts drift back to the wedding and his wife, Stacy. What could have been and what should have been, he mumbles as he heads for the cupboard and grabs the whiskey bottle. He takes two long, hard swallows before he sits down and thinks about her again. Bitterness. He fights down the whiskey. A burning sensation follows the alcohol down to his stomach. Steve grimaces. He knows that this will temporarily dull the pain. She was so young, so beautiful, and his. His and his alone for all eternity. At least that's how Steve thought it would be. After all, isn't it supposed to work like that? Till death do us part, he thought. But now he sits alone in an apartment with nothing but divorce papers and memories. Stacy had the house and custody of Carrie. Lord, does it get any better than this? He tips the bottle up and drinks until the burn becomes too much to handle. He cringes and forces the whiskey down as some spills from his lips and trails down the furrows of his mouth. Steve almost missed the birth of his daughter. They called him off patrol to inform him that Stacy was on her way to the hospital. Her water had broken. Sergeant Shevsky, then only a patrolman, rushed to the hospital just in time to be whisked into the delivery room to see his child emerge from Stacy and take her first breath. He remembers tears of joy streaming down his face as he stood there, not only as a cop in full uniform, but also as the new father of a beautiful baby girl, one of God's innocent creations. Stacy, also crying, commented that it was the first time she had ever seen him cry. Now in the present, Steve is crying again. Only these tears are not tears of joy. They are drunken tears of sorrow. Sorrow over the loss of his marriage. A marriage that failed because he was unable to open up. He was cold. Steve tried, but it just wasn't in him to open up. Stacy also tried. She tried to understand, but eventually grew tired of trying. The relationship soured and they grew apart. Just going through the motions, she called it. Stacy wanted more, needed more. She wanted love and affection, companionship and friendship. But all she got was TV and beer. It just wasn't in him. Now Steve's sorry that the relationship is over. He knows that he is cold. He also knows things he cannot change. I'm a cop. It goes with the job, a job hazard. You become cold and callous. It happens to every cop eventually, Steve said. Her reply to that had been, you were that way before you became a cop. You've been that way all along. I know nothing of your childhood, and I've only met your mother twice. Carrie doesn't even know her grandma. Steve has never been able to open up to anyone. He and his mother were never close. Why? He doesn't know. Nor does he really care. His father died when Steve was a boy, and he has no memories at all of his childhood. 
It's as if one day, Steve popped out of nowhere, a teenager, followed closely by his younger brother, Dean. Steve never talks of his past or his family with anyone, not even Dean. They just hang out and talk about high school memories, girls, and their present lives. No talk of when they were young or why Steve and his mother, who's very close with Dean, don't and never did get along. This makes Steve feel different from everyone, like he was never a child, no parents or anything. He went from nothing to a teenager and his life started from there. Although sad, it doesn't bother him. At least it, it didn't until Stacy asked him to leave. Drunk and depressed, Steve falls asleep or he passes out. The dreams of screaming and torture come again. Only this time, they're more in focus than ever before. Slumped and comatose in the chair, the demon is unleashed inside his mind. The picture plays like a movie, with Steve being the only one in the audience for its anonymous cast of characters. He watches a child, a boy, get savagely beaten across the back and buttocks with an orange Hot Wheels track. The orange plastic slices through the calm, dark air and cracks against the naked skin of the child. The strikes come fast, hard, and often, causing the child to lose control of his bladder and urinate on the floor. Each hit sends a loud crack echoing deep into Steve's mind. The child winces with each blow, but utters no sound. This child is a veteran of many beatings and learned long ago to suffer in silence. Steve concentrates hard, trying to see the boy's face. He desperately yearns to know who this kid is. It's a blur. Steve can't clearly see the face, but he knows that the boy isn't crying. Pain no longer hurts this little soldier. His well of tears has long ago run dry. To him, the beatings are just another event in his meaningless life. No pain, no joy, just day that turns to night, sun to dark and back to light. Steve springs back to consciousness, shaking and covered with sweat. He remembers the dream. Who's this boy? Who the fuck's beating him? Why? Why am I dreaming this? Do I know this kid? Or am I just so screwed up inside that I'm imagining all this torture? Maybe punishing someone, maybe myself for the marriage failure. Steve pauses and shakes his head. Man, do I ever need some help? He glances down to the empty bottle in his hand. Steve shrugs, rolls out of the chair and ambles over to the kitchen. He grabs a beer from the refrigerator and staggers back to the chair. He turns on the TV and begins to drink from the bottle, afraid to go back to sleep. Steve doesn't want to watch the child, whoever he is, suffer anymore. He drinks and flips through the cable channels with the remote. Rising from the chair only to get more beer or visit the bathroom, Steve spends the rest of his day off drinking and watching three movies. By nightfall, he blacked out again, his mind too numb to dream. Alcohol-induced sleep assures him that he'll have no pain in sleep, no thoughts of the women, no Stacy, and no movie of a child being hit by the orange track. The television plays all night as Sergeant Shevsky slumps in the chair. A motionless mass, too numb to feel, too drunk to move. Why should you buy a book from your local bookstore? Because books are functional, even when there's no internet connection, no power, and no working electronic devices. Books are backwards compatible for hundreds of years, as long as the words can be read on the pages. Electronic devices are backwards compatible for about 20 years. Books can literally last hundreds, if not thousands of years. Your cell phone will be outdated in six months. 
Your electronic device will encounter planned obsolescence, but your copy of a book never will. Your local bookstore is a happy, friendly place where everyone is welcome, and there's nothing like that smell of a brand new book. Your local bookstore is also one of our sponsors, so support Criminal Miles by supporting our sponsors and purchase your copy of this season's Miles Lawrence book there. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue-generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at mifn.net. Chapter 7 Steve awakens to the alarm clock and a hard-on. Still fully clothed in his running gear, the erection swells under the blue shorts. He smells of alcohol and sweat. Unable to open up, he utters the awful words spoken by his crying wife. Fuck! At least I was faithful to her, he replies in a raspy voice. That was true. In all the years of their marriage, Steve, a reasonably good-looking man, had many opportunities to sleep with various women, some even prettier than Stacy. He was flattered, often tempted, but smiled and said, No thanks, I'm happily married. In today's society, those two words seem to be a contradiction in terms. Happily married. Steve feels he's the last of a dying breed the faithful male looking for a commitment. Years ago, he's forgotten how many, when still in uniform on patrol, he pulled over a black Corvette for speeding. It was about 3 a.m. when the black blur shot by him on Jefferson Avenue, heading east. Steve hit the lights, activated the siren, stopped the gas, and scrambled for the radio. Having no idea who was in the vet or why they were jetting down Jefferson Avenue, Steve called dispatch. He, being careful, wanted a backup. The driver of the black missile must have seen the lights or heard the siren because the Corvette slowed and pulled to the curb, stopping ever so innocently. Patrolman Shevsky, that was his rank, stopped the cruiser about 15 feet behind the vet. The unit straddled the lane marker with the left tires well into the second lane of traffic. This gave Steve a cushion of space and safety from the oncoming traffic as he approached and spoke with the driver of the speeding car, Academy Training. Before he climbed from the squad car, Steve scribbled down the license number of the vet on a pad of paper that he had in the front seat. More Academy Training. In case your backup finds you lying dead in the street with no violator, the license number will provide the other cops with a suspect vehicle to track and find your killers. Also, although less dramatic, it makes you stop, think, and look at the situation you're about to enter. He approached the vet carefully, right thumb on the release lever of his clamshell holster. His hand wrapped around the wooden grip of his 38 caliber service revolver. His mind raced, his body set for action. Steve noted his footwork, careful to keep himself balanced and ready to move. Constant practice allowed him to manage all this and still walk nonchalantly, as viewed by the untrained eye. The driver's side window of the Corvette slowly rolls down, steady, so it has to be electric. A beautiful blonde sticks her head out of the window. Her long, poker-straight hair gently frames a tan face with high cheekbones and perfect lips. What's wrong? She asks softly. Steve relaxes. Do you have any idea why I stopped you, ma'am? His eyes lock on the stunning woman. She's about 24, he guesses. She shakes her head no, almost toying with his emotions. Can I see your proof of insurance license and registration, he asks, forcing himself to remain professional. 
She begins to flirt with Steve as she ruffles through her purse. He steps closer to the window to get a better look at the lady. A look won't hurt, he tells himself. Her green dress is low cut, exposing breasts that are smashed together, bulging out in a massive cleavage. Steve takes a deep breath and sighs as he stares at the pair. Perfect ones too. Not a mole on him. The search lasts five minutes, complete with excuses. Officer Shevsky doesn't mind. It gave him five full minutes of pleasure, staring at her huge tits and fantasizing. Finally, she smiles. Officer, I really don't have a license. It's expired. And this isn't my car, it's, well, it's, it's my boyfriend's. Back to business. Steve replies professionally, well, driving a vehicle without a license is a crime. I'm going to have to take you in and make sure that the car isn't stolen. Please, step out of the vehicle, he says, very politely and matter-of-factly. Don't bullshit or bully women. Be polite but firm. He remembered thinking that, but couldn't remember exactly who told him that little piece of useful information. Sometimes we forget the ones who tell us the most useful shit. The blonde, he can't recall her name, doesn't want to go to jail. She winks at Steve and licks her lips. Couldn't we work out another arrangement? Say, a blowjob for my freedom? Steve smiles. He doesn't blush or waver from the task at hand. No thanks. That's my wife's department. She wouldn't like it if I went elsewhere for head. Now, please, step out of the car. She slowly climbs from the car, all 5 feet 11 inches of gorgeous Amazon beauty. The body complements the face, her long legs shapely and sexy. The green dress clings to every curve, like it was painted on earlier in the evening. Impressive, he thinks as he pats her down with the back of his hand. He then places her in the rear of a squad car. Steve was quite tempted by the offer. A lesser man may have jumped at the chance, but Steve was married and on duty. He remained faithful to both obligations. Now he's not married and works in plain clothes. Something about a man in uniform impresses women, but that was years ago. Now, Steve sits in his chair, longing for that blonde. A blowjob would be the very thing to start this day. He no longer has anyone to be faithful to. He showered slowly, dressed comfortably, and took his time getting to the station. The hangover is awful. Any fast movement makes his head ring and his stomach quiver threatening reverse peristalsis, a.k.a. vomiting. Steve isn't halfway in the detective bureau door when Joe Vinoli yells, Hey Sarge, we got a break. Number two had a record. Her name is Lisa Gentry. The Leighton Prints Department faxed her sheet up about a half hour ago. Seems four years ago she got popped with some crack. Got probation. Steve forces a smile. His head rings. Joe continues. Topper and Stan are already on their way over to her place. I stayed to wait for you. Steve stops in his tracks, turns, and begins to leave the building. Joe Vinoli, dressed in his red and black sweatsuit, follows. Detective Vinoli drives as Sergeant Shevsky reclines in the passenger seat, head back, eyes shut, and dealing with the results of yesterday's slam session. Sarge, you look like shit remarks the bearded detective. In the glove box, I got Alka-Seltzer, aspirin, or a little hair of the dog. Your choice. Steve smiles but declines all three. This is the first time any of his crew has ever said a word about his drinking. He wonders if it's becoming a problem. Well, he knows that it's already a problem, but maybe, just maybe, it's getting worse. Joe pulls the car up to the corner of Lisa Gentry's block. What the fuck are all these cars doing here? Why isn't this area roped off? Barks Steve. It is roped off. All these cars belong to us. And the FBI, answers Vanoli. Didn't Scanlon tell you? Tell me what? He asks, already somewhat sure of the answer to his question. 
Since Lisa's been confirmed as victim number two, this has been labeled a serial case. The FBI has just been waiting for the murder scene to be located. Now that it has, they're involved in the investigation. We're supposed to give them our full cooperation and allow them access to all our files to date. Great, Steve whines. Now we gotta help the fucking accountants with guns. He pauses a moment as his anger builds. Fuck that. Unless we get yanked from this, we're going to conduct our own investigation. If the feds want to see our ship, they can. But I ain't gonna sit back and watch them stick their thumb up their ass and hop around. I want our crew to nail this sick son of a bitch. Giovanoli smiles. Anything you say, boss. Steve interrupts. Now, go find Topper and Stan. Tell them that they're to report directly to me and only to me. The feds may be able to run this investigation and use all our shit, but they ain't gonna run my crew. Gotcha, Joe says as he climbs from his car and starts to leave. Hey, Vinoli, Steve asks. You know what FBI stands for? Joe pauses and turns around. No, what? Baggots, bureaucrats, and imbeciles. Detective Vinoli walks away smiling. He'll never say it, but he's glad Steve is such a hard ass. He knows Sergeant Shesky will never allow anyone to run his team. Steve also takes flack from his guys and spreads the praise around equally. Joe, Stan, and Topper all admit they couldn't find another boss as good as Steve. That's why they cover his drinking. They like him and want to continue working under him, so they cover for him when he's had too much. It's the least they can do since Steve has covered for each of them many times over. Sergeant Chesky climbs from the car and begins to amble towards the gentry house. The sun shines brightly in his eyes. He squints. Steve's barely able to make out the figure of a man approaching him. The figure, a young man, clean-shaven, in a dark blue suit and striped red tie, walks directly up to Steve and offers a hand. Sergeant Shevsky, he asks. I'm Special Agent Skip Handelman of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'll be the agent in charge of this investigation. You and your people will join the collective efforts of our organizations and help catch this maniac. Fuck you, Skippy. Steve snaps at the young, dark-haired, hotshot agent. I know you have jurisdiction in this case. And I also know that my lieutenant wants me to bend over and kiss your federal pimple-covered ass. But I ain't going to do it. You can take yourself and the rest of your college-educated bookworms and conduct your own investigation. I'll take my team and do likewise. You can look at my paperwork my team generates, but under no circumstances will any of my crew raise a fucking finger to help you. They answer to me and only to me. You want to talk with my boys? You go through me. Steve walks past the agent and heads towards the house. Agent Handelman follows closely behind like an obedient puppy. Sergeant, I've heard of your reputation, and I don't think that your Lieutenant Scanlon will be happy to hear that you have chosen this path. Why don't you just join the team? Steve stops and spins around. A marvelous feat for a man with a massive hangover. Listen, G-Man. I told you once when I was being polite. I'll stay out of your gel-coated hair and share information with you. But under no circumstances will I join your fucking team. My crew will conduct its own separate investigation. May the best cop win. He turns back around and walks into the house, leaving Agent Handelman standing alone, fuming. Upon entering the house, Sergeant Shevsky sees all the evidence techs, city and federal, scurrying about the small two-story building. Fingerprint powder is being applied everywhere. Two men, one that Steve recognizes as a Detroit officer, the other he guesses to be FBI, are vacuuming the carpets and furniture, gathering hair and fiber samples. Steve turns to his left. Blood stains are everywhere. The door frame, the carpet, and even the ceiling are all covered with thick, dried, smelly, dark red blood. A federal agent clad in a black suit and a loud yellow tie, is busy taking samples, scraping them off the door frame. Steve looks around casually until he spots his men. Topper and Stan are huddled around Joe Vanelli. They seem to hang on his every word. They don't move as Steve approaches them. Sarge, Joe blurts. I was just giving these two the lowdown on our situation. Sergeant Shevsky smiles briefly reminding himself again of the hangover. Okay, great. Now, I want the three of you to be polite to the accountants. 
If they ask you anything, direct them to me. If they request paperwork, direct them to me. We'll cooperate fully with Skippy and his little investigation, but all relaying of information will be done through me and me alone. Why? Copper asks. With his voice low, confident and direct, Steve replies. Hopefully, they'll eventually get the hint and leave you three alone. I still plan on investigating these killings ourselves. The FBI can come into our precinct and play, but I'll be damned if I'm going to sit by and do nothing while these desk jockeys drag their asses. He pauses for effect. I want this lunatic before he kills again. And truth be known, these shirt and tie fucks couldn't find their dicks with peanut butter and a dog. We'll conduct our own investigation, follow up our own leads, and work together. If they want to see our paperwork, fine. I'll share, but my crew isn't going to play gopher for the feds. Okay, Stevie, what do you want from us? Stan asked. You and Topper go find Lisa Gentry's parents. Break the bad news to them. Be very compassionate, but try to get them to give you a list of all her known friends and boyfriends, past and present. Joe, you go back to Ellen Adams' parents and do the same. We'll cross-check the lists for matches. I'm not so sure these are random selections. There's a connection. You just have to find it. What are you going to do, Sarge? Joe asks, upset by his assignment. Me? I'm going back to the station to get my ass chewed on by Scanlon. I just jumped all over Skippy the Fed, and I know he's going to run crying to the lieutenant. Then, after he reams my ass, I'm going to try and smooth things out. Explain my side, as soon as I think of it. Then I'm going to go and see the Dragon Lady. Try to work up a preliminary profile of our killer. Want to come? No thanks, Joe Vanoli exhales. I'll go talk to the parents, he says apologetically, not wanting any part of a sergeant's day. Talking to the parents of a murdered girl seems mild when compared to the shit Steve's facing. The FBI had already brought the tragic news to Lisa Gentry's parents. Her father had already returned from the morgue where he tearfully identified the lifeless, mangled body of his offspring. The windows of the Royal Oak Bungalow are closed up as Stan and Topper pull to the curb in front of the red brick dwelling. After getting Stu Gentry's home address from the Royal Oak Police and telling them of their presence in their town, Topper called the 7th Precinct and left a message for Steve. Heading over to the Gentry house, they already got the news. Fathers agreed to speak with us briefly. As usual, Topper will do the talking with Stan standing by as silent support. Stu Gentry, a 45-year-old laborer for Chrysler, slowly opens the door to his home. Earlier in the day, he saw the lifeless corpse of his only child stretched out on a steel table at the Wayne County morgue. Now, he must speak with two homicide investigators about her death. He stares blankly at the two men, each in a t-shirt and blue jeans. Detectives? He asks. Yes, sir. I'm Detective David Saunders, and this is Detective Sergeant Stan Walker. Allow me to extend our deepest sympathies to you and your family, Topper says, sincere in his feelings. Gentlemen, please come in. Gentry forces the words from his dry throat. Tears still stream from his puffy eyes. Follow me to the kitchen. I can spare a few moments. Would it be possible to speak with your wife also? Stan softly asks. No, I gave her a tranquilizer. She's sleeping. It's hard for her. Lisa and her mother were close. His voice drifts off. Words stick in his throat as he fights the tears. I understand this is extremely difficult for you, Mr. Gentry. And if it were at all possible, we'd leave you alone with your grief. But in order to get this monster, we're going to need your help. Topper says, choosing his words carefully. His statement works. Mr. Gentry, wanting to help catch the killer of his daughter, musters strength. He wipes at his eyes and clears his throat. Anything I can do. Just name it. I want to nail the bastard that did this to my baby. Stu breaks down again briefly. Topper continues in a direct, monotone, business-like voice. What we need from you, sir, is a list complete with the addresses and telephone numbers, if you can, of all your daughter's past and present friends and relationships. 
as well as anyone you might think may have wanted to harm your daughter. You don't think that you don't think someone she knew could have done this? He asks angrily. We don't know, sir, but we owe it to Lisa to check out any possibilities. Again, selecting his words carefully. Fine. Give me a minute to collect my thoughts, Stu says as he opens the refrigerator and reaches for a beer. That's when Stan notices the eyes. He should have seen this earlier. Half of the puffiness and redness are from tears, but the other half are from alcohol. Mr. Gentry, in trying to deal with the trauma, has tried to dull the pain with alcohol. Stan Walker understands his motivation. Years ago, when his daughter died in a fiery car wreck, Stan climbed into a bottle for the better part of a year. If it hadn't been for Steve, Stan knows that he would still be in the vodka bottle. He mumbles a silent prayer for his deceased daughter and for Lisa Gentry, and wishes strength for Mr. Gentry and his wife. Stu, a union man, employed on the afternoon shift at Chrysler's Mound Road engine plant, finishes his beer, grabs another, and begins to rattle off names, descriptions, and phone numbers. Each name is followed by a dissertation of the person's character and relationship with Lisa. Stan Walker silently smiles at the beer-bellied auto worker, encouraging him to continue while Topper busily scribbles in his notebook. The talk lasts well over an hour, as well as four beers, and yields 22 names, 15 of which Lisa had relationships with over the past two years. A lot of men for only two years worth of dating, thinks Stan, but he says nothing. He can tell from Topper's posture that he feels the same. None of the women, and all but four of the men, are still friends of Lisa's. Topper underlines the names of the ones that Stu labeled as trouble. Stu Gentry recounted his daughter as a warm, friendly girl with lots of friends and a zest for life. Topper agreed and offered shame for such a wonderful girl to be taken from us at such an early stage in her life. The statement draws a hug from the half-drunk, grief-stricken father. Again, Topper and Stan offer their sympathy. They begin to leave. Stu calls to them from the doorway as the detectives near their car. You know, once she dated a cop, he tries to portray his daughter as a woman with good taste and almost saint-like values. Lasted about a month. Good-looking guy, too. Can't recall his name, though. Wish she'd kept that one. But no, Lisa was having too much fun to settle down and get serious. Although it's obvious to the detectives that Lisa Gentry was very promiscuous, neither had said an unkind word about victim number two. In fact, they barely spoke at all during the trip down I-75 from Royal Oak back to the station. Each man, in his own way, understood the pain and felt for Stu Gentry and his family. Joe Vinoli hopes for a different set of circumstances as he drives to the Warren home of Ellen Adams' family. Please let these folks be past the denial, grief, and bargaining stages, he thought. Being a cop, he's best at dealing with the last stage of accepting death. Anger. Stages 1 and 2, denial and grief, give him the most trouble, since he's not a compassionate man. Police work, especially in Detroit, has hardened Joe and made him somewhat cynical. He arrives at the Adams home just after 4 p.m. John Adams, Ellen's father, is home from work and has agreed to take time from dinner to speak with the bearded detective. Ellen's mother, Gloria, will not be in attendance. She isn't ready to talk about her child's murder again. Gloria still hasn't recovered from the first round of questioning by the police, and the memory of her daughter's burial is still fresh in her mind. A skinny, gray-haired man in a white dress shirt and red striped tie opens the door. Mr. Vinoli, is it? Detective Vinoli. And please, call me Joe. Sure, Joe. Come in, replies John Adams, in a voice that sounds tired and older than his years. Joe enters the house located two blocks north of Ten Mile Road, extends his sympathy and apologizes for any inconvenience caused by his visit. Gloria and her daughter, Susan, a cute teenager, leave the living room and head down the hallway out of sight. 
Giovanoli is led into the family's den, a modestly decorated room with a television, a DVR, two couches, and a recliner, all green. John Adams sits in the recliner and motions for Detective Vinoli to take a seat on the smaller couch. Joe does so. He immediately feels out of place. His red sweatsuit clashes with the green decor and gives a Christmassy setting, though the mood is of pain and sadness. What can I do for you, Joe? John says, trying to act composed. Like I said on the phone, Mr. Adams, I wanted to sit down with you and compile a list of Ellen's friends and past boyfriends, as well as the names of anyone who might have threatened her or wanted to do her harm. Joe is careful not to speak in the past tense when referring to the dead girl. You got it, John replies firmly. I'll do anything to get my hands on that son of a bitch you carved up my girl. He said it. Joe heard it. He's now sure that Mr. Adams is into the anger stage of his feelings. Now, Joe can relax somewhat. The two began to make a list of Ellen's friends. It's short. A pretty girl like her doesn't have all that many girlfriends. Jealousy, I guess, comments John Adams. Joe thinks back to his older sister. She was always beautiful and never seemed to have a lot of girlfriends. He agrees with John Adams' line of reasoning. Next comes a list of her past boyfriends. Most of them from years ago, since her and her fiancé, the one who had found the blood, had been steady for quite a while. John Adams did fairly well recalling the names and phone numbers of her old bows. He used to take all of her messages. Then comes the short but graphic list of enemies. Mr. Adams goes into extreme detail about events, arguments, and fights that Ellen had with anyone over the last four years. It became apparent to Joe that Ellen confided a lot in her father. He had made a mental note of that. Some of the stories were interesting and Joe made careful notes. A few good leads to be checked out. He thanked Mr. Adams for the help and started to leave. If, I mean, when, you catch the fucker, I get first crack at him, John Adams squawks. Joe, being a father himself, knows this to be a serious statement. He drives back to the station relieved that he didn't have to deal with Mrs. Adams or the sister. I can't stand to see a woman cry, he mumbles. Deep inside, the tough exterior of the street-hardened cop lies the heart of an old softy. Giovanelli knows this and keeps it as his own little secret. Steve knew he was in for a battle. Jumping all over Agent Handelman wasn't a good idea. He should have handled it better. Sugarcoating might have worked, but that just isn't his style. Steve has always spoken his mind, no matter what the consequences. Regardless, Steve's pissed. This is his case. Scanlon dumped it on him, and he isn't about to play second fiddle to any damned accountant. Sergeant Shevsky storms through the bureau. All eyes are on him as he kicks open the door to Lieutenant Scanlon's office. The door slams against the wall and rebounds to a close as Steve barges in and bellies up to his lieutenant's desk. Steve speaks first, catching his lieutenant off guard by charging into the office. What the hell is going on? How come I wasn't told that the FBI was in on this? Scanlon fires back, ignoring Steve's questions. Sergeant, and I mean for the time being, what in the fuck do you think you're doing jumping in the face of a federal officer? A fellow peacemaker? And you're telling him you'll not cooperate in a joint investigation? Steve interrupts, raising his voice to the level of his lieutenants. I never said I wouldn't cooperate. I said I wasn't going to butler for some snot-nosed bookkeeper and I won't. You dumped this case in my lap, and if it blows up, I'm the scapegoat. You said that yourself, remember? He bellows, pointing his index finger at Scanlon. So I did. What the hell does that have to do with anything, Sergeant? Scanlon says, emphasizing Steve's subordinate position. Simple, Lou, Steve says calmly. You know as well as I do that the feds walk around with their heads up their pencil-pushing asses. They're not real cops, like us, he says, fishing for support. They're trained as lawyers and bookkeepers, not cops. They don't have our feel for the streets, and they're not like you and me. Steve now has his boss's ear. What exactly are you saying, Steve? Hmm. He called me Steve. I've got him, thinks Sergeant Shevsky. He says, I'll cooperate in any way possible. I'll share information, but I want to continue with the investigation that my crew started. That will give us two separate, but joint investigations. 
If the feds start barking up the wrong tree, we'll have our own shit to fall back on and maybe break the case. That would make you and the department look damned good. Scanlon smiles. He can see the headlines. Detroit detectives break case. FBI chases its own tail. He knows that this could be a political work of genius for him, and if it backfires, Steve's still the scapegoat. Okay, I see what you mean, Scanlon says. Just between you and I, the FBI is a bunch of screw-ups. They're not real cops like you and I. They've never been in the trenches like us. So go ahead, keep your case going, but don't stomp on any more toes. I can't keep running interference for you. Steve steps back from the desk, easing his stance. Lou, one more request. Can you keep Skippy away from my guys? They already have too much to do without schlepping for the Federal Bureau of Idiots. I'll see what I can do, Scanlon says. Now go on. Steve pivots and walks calmly from the office. He has to bite his tongue to keep from smiling. His ploy worked. When you're wrong and you're about to get an ass chewing, go in there ranting and raving. It's hard to jump into anyone's ass when you're busy backpedaling. He takes the elevator downstairs. Next stop, across town to see the Dragon Lady and attempt to start working up a profile on this nutcase. Steve doesn't trust the FBI and wants his own profile to work from. As he drives, Steve remembers forming his team four years ago. He needed a new crew. His old one had been disbanded. One of his team died during a raid. The raid was a fiasco. No communication. Steve's old team was attempting to raid a suspected murderer's house. Somehow, dispatch was never told. A neighbor saw the plainclothes officers snooping around and called the police. She reported a breaking and entering in progress. Uniforms converged upon the house, entering from the front. Unbeknownst to them, Steve's team now in jeans and Detroit Police Department windbreakers, came in from the back. The house was dark. Shots were exchanged. No one knew who they shot at. Each thought they were involved in a shootout with criminals. When it ended, two cops lay on the floor. The uniformed officer survived, but Steve's friend and partner, Detective Tony Paulson, died en route to the hospital. The two officers had crossed paths in the dark and shot each other. That's where the official investigation turned up. Officials high up in the department blamed poor communication for the incident, although no one was disciplined. Privately, Steve blamed department policy for the death of his friend as well as the end of two careers. The uniform cop resigned under mental distress and anxiety resulting from the shooting. Steve heard something about real estate and silently wished the man luck. Result of the day, two purple hearts, one dead cop, no change of policy, and the disbanding of Sergeant Shevsky's old crew. Stevenson retired soon after that. Michaels transferred to Vice, started drinking, and got fired. Steve rarely kept in touch with them and hasn't seen either one in years. He heard that Stevenson left Michigan and moved to Florida. Still driving, he thinks of how his new crew came to be. Topper was in uniform on patrol in Steve's precinct. The sergeant had read Topper's reports, excellent content, and he knew of his reputation for being organized and thorough. Topper had to be part of the crew. It needed a record keeper to take Stevenson's place and Topper filled the void. Plus, Steve liked Topper and believed that he'd make a fine detective. Topper proved his boss right on many occasions. Stan and Steve went to the academy together. Except for his prankster personality and dry sense of humor, Stan should have been a command officer by now. But he's made way too many enemies along the way and will never have the political clout necessary for promotion. Detective Sergeant is the highest rank that he'll ever ascribe to and Stan's been there for the last eight years. Despite his personality, Steve knew Stan to be a fantastic cop and an excellent skip tracer. Just a guy to have helping you track down killers on the run. He was also given an invitation to join Steve's team, one which he gladly accepted. It got him out of Detroit's west side and into homicide. Joe Vinoli was different. He fashioned himself as a ladies man. Although remarried, he still played around. 
short and stocky with slicked back jet black hair, he looks and acts tough. Proves it as well. Another excellent choice. More often than not, in this line of work, you have to be physical. Now, Steve can take care of himself, but Topper's too skinny and stands too old and out of shape. Sergeant Shesky decided he needed more muscle, and the caveman look-alike named Joe Vanelli was the best applicant. His beard and one thick eyebrow gave him an eerie appearance, one that the ladies find attractive and the men fear and respect, as ordered one brawler. Steve searched for and found exactly what he wanted, three excellent cops, each with his own special skill. One tough guy, one master tracker, the third, a skilled interviewer and excellent record keeper. They all grew close. Each can now count on any of the other three to back him in any situation. They say cops look out for each other, but these four take that phrase three steps beyond. Steve's crew is fantastic, the best in the precinct, possibly the best in the city. Handpicked by Sergeant Shevsky, another tiny fact that digs under the skin of Lieutenant Scanlon. Scanlon gets credit when Steve and his crew do well, but he and everyone else knows that Steve's really the brains behind the success, not Scanlon. Steve pulls the unmarked car into the parking lot of the Dragon Lady's office. He parks and gets out. Her office, located on Jefferson Avenue in Gross Point, overlooks the Detroit River across from Canada. Her patients find the view peaceful and relaxing. The Dragon Lady, Nancy Sturgis, had been a practicing psychiatrist for 18 years. The last 10, she's also worked with the Detroit Police Department aiding in the development of suspect psychological profiles. She has a knack for being able to read a report, climb into the head of the criminal, and steal his thoughts, personality habits, and motives. The nickname comes from abilities almost mystic as well as her personality. Nancy recognized him immediately. She'd worked with Steve in the past. Instantly, she saw the signs. Ruddy complexion, bloodshot eyes, and slow walk. Nancy had heard the rumors about his divorce and subsequent drinking. She passed no judgment, offered no sorrow or pity. Not yet, she thought. Give him the benefit of the doubt. She said, Sergeant Shevsky, what can I do for you? No greeting, all business. Dragon, Dr. Sturgis, how are you? Fine, Sergeant. Again, what can I do for you? Asked the lady in the green business suit. Cold bitch, Steve thought as he sized her up, looking for any weakness. Her hair pulled back tight across her head and wrapped into a bun. The kind that old women wear. Prude, he thought. He said, I need a favor. I have a case, a serial murderer and I need a profile. What do you have? She asked coldly. Her face, without makeup, is pale and clammy. Steve pictures fire coming from her nostrils. He smiles. Two killings definitely linked. All the information we have is in this file. He holds the manila envelope out for her inspection. Put it on my desk. I'll need a few days to view it. Then, if I can, I'll work up a profile. Do you have a lot of information? Not much, he replies, setting the file jacket down on her plain wooden desk. That's when she saw it, the shakiness in his hands. Slight, but evident. Nancy knew it. Let me be the judge of how much evidence you have. I am the expert. Bitch, Steve mumbled just loud enough for her to hear. She ignored the comment and turned to walk behind her desk. Good day, Sergeant. I have patience to see. Steve turned to walk out. She commented, Sergeant, if you need it, I do counseling for members of the force. What does that mean? He blurts out, pissed at her arrogance. I know that a divorce can be rough, but alcohol is not the answer. You needn't throw away your life. I can help you if you want. Thanks, but I'm doing all right, dragon lady, he snorts. I don't need any shrink's advice on how to walk the straight and narrow. Suit yourself. She sits down behind the oak desk. I buy you books, but all you do is eat the pages. Call me when you get the profile done and hurry, he says, as he storms out, knowing that she's right. He needs help with the divorce and the alcohol. Nancy Sturgis closes her eyes and eases her head back. I have to learn to keep my mouth shut. She sighs and presses the buzzer. Hillary, send in Mr. Jackson, please. Later that night, three events are taking place simultaneously. 
One man sits in his chair, staring blankly at the television. He's drinking Jack Daniels straight from the bottle. Down at FBI headquarters, Agent Handelman and his staff are busy going over paperwork, trying to piece together clues and prepare their own profile of the killer. In a beautiful four-bedroom house in one of Detroit's suburbs, a man, totally naked, does push-ups. One, two, one, two. He counts with each movement, slowly lowering himself to the floor. As his chest touches the brown carpet, his nose brushes against the metal blade. It's bloodstained, stained from its two victims. He happily breathes in the scent of dried blood human blood, the blood from victims one and two. He smiles, content to still be living alone. No one will ever know. This episode of Criminal Miles was brought to you by the Michigan Film Network, creators and distributors of revenue generating entertainment since 2010. To learn more about opportunities with the Michigan Film Network, visit them at MIFN.net. Why should you buy a book from your local bookstore? Because books are functional. Even when there's no internet connection, no power, and no working electronic devices. Books are backwards compatible for hundreds of years as long as the words can be read on the pages. Electronic devices are backwards compatible for about 20 years. Books can literally last hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Your cell phone will be outdated in six months. Your electronic device will encounter planned obsolescence, but your copy of a book never will. Your local bookstore is a happy, friendly place where everyone is welcome. And there's nothing like that smell of a brand new book. Your local bookstore is also one of our sponsors. So support Criminal Miles by supporting our sponsors and purchase your copy of this season's Miles Lawrence book there. For more information on this podcast, visit the Michigan Film Network at MIFN.net. Get your copy of Miles Lawrence's book, Keeping Score, on Amazon today, so you can read along with each episode. To order a signed copy of the book, or to meet Miles Lawrence at a local bookstore, follow him on Facebook. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Criminal Miles so you don't miss upcoming episodes. All stories told on this podcast are done so with the written consent from the author, Miles Lawrence. No portion of this podcast may be rebroadcast or otherwise distributed without the expressed written consent of the Criminal Miles production team and the author, Miles Lawrence. Criminal Miles is part of the Michigan Film Network podcast series. This episode of Criminal Miles was recorded in the basement of the Michigan Film Network.